Good afternoon and welcome to day five of the Orkney International Science Festival 2023. My name is Eric Walker and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session here in the Phoenix Cinema. Now, before we start, I've got a little bit of housekeeping. Um, basically, could you uh, turn your mobile phones off the ringtone? Um, but could you please keep them on in that you may want to submit questions and comments using our system called Slido. If you point your smartphone camera at the QR code on the left, that directly to the, the screen where you can input your questions or you can type in www.slido.com and the, enter the code 343-5541 and that also takes you in. We will also be asking questions using the usual roaming microphone way, so you just put your hand up at the end and someone will come and hand you the microphone. We need you to use the microphone because this is being live streamed and in order for your voices to be heard in the wide world, we need you to use the microphone. One little bit of housekeeping, in the event of a fire alarm going off, could you please use fire exits at the bottom or at the top? But to be honest with you, just follow the uh, festival team because we'll be out of here first. So here we go. Now on to a family tale of dancing and numbers. Our speakers today are sisters Jane Harrison and Lindsay Smith and Dr. James Cranch. Jane and Lindsay are the daughters of Tom Flett, a great mathematician, and they have returned to the Science Festival to tell the family story of their father and their mother Joan, who are best known for co-authoring the classic book Traditional Dancing in Scotland. James Cranch is from the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Sheffield. He was born in Guernsey, educated at Trinity College Cambridge and the University of Sheffield, where he received a T.M. Flett Prize for his PhD thesis. He works in pure mathematics and is interested in its connections to computer science. Today, James will look at Tom Flett's mathematical background and introduce us to the Flett Mean Value Theorem. There we go. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's over to you. Good afternoon. I'm Lindsay, and Jane's over there. And many thanks to Eric for our introduction. We're especially pleased to welcome James, who is saving us from trying to explain our dad's mathematics. Thank you, James. <laughs> our dad, Tom, was born in London in 1923. And although his parents were born in Scotland, he was not aware of the flat connection to Orkney until he came here dance collecting in 1955. We were to find that it was his great grandfather, James, born here in Firth in 1820 who had moved to Glasgow by 1840. James Flett was in turn a teacher, a grocer, and an engineer. Here are the next two generations of civil engineers on a sewer contract near Edinburgh. The gentleman on the left is our granddad, and the gentleman in the suit in the middle is great granddad. Our dad's family were part of Wembley Scottish Society, and like his parents before him, he, went, he was sent to dancing classes, much to his initial disgust. He learnt social and highland dance, and this led eventually to his passion, lifelong passion for, for, for dancing. His interest in mathematics was his, his interest in mathematics was developed at his scholarship high school. Due to the outbreak of war, he had to, do, he had to study part-time for his degrees while working full-time at the post office research station, Dollis Hill. What he got up to at work, we have no idea. He died before, he died before it was declassified. 
We only know that he detonated small chemical explosions on colleagues' workbenches. After the war, he asked to study at Cambridge under Dr. John Littlewood. Littlewood features in the film the man who knew infinity about the, Ameri the Indian mathematician Ramanujan. Our parents' interest in Scottish dance started in Cambridge. Our parents married in 1948, moving to Liverpool in 1950 when our dad became assistant lecturer, and then to Sheffield in 1967 when he became professor. When not teaching, he would be scribbling away every weekend and every evening, <laughs> sat with us in the living room, but in his own research world. Our dad's incredible output in both maths and dancing would not have been possible without our mum, Joan. She's dancing, she's dancing in Cambridge in the 1940s, and the, the, late, the, the, oh, the se second picture is in about 2010. They met through dancing, and all their dance research was a joint enterprise. It's down to her grit and determination that their incredible legacy lives on. Her superpower was in helping to proofread every word he wrote, article or book, maths or dancing, every symbol, Greek letter or curly bracket, all at normal reading speed. Our dad died in 1976 at the age of 52. He is still remembered for his last dance talk in 1975 when he was dancing on a laboratory bench. And as has been said, James was presented with the FLET prize. And I'll ask James to talk about our dad's mathematics. Thanks very much. Um, it's a great honour to be here and it's a particular honour as I'm one of a very small number of speakers today who are not and have never been called Flett. So, um, my name comes from, my middle name comes from no closer than Aberdeen. Um, this was a sort of tall order to give this talk. But, um, I, Tom Flett died uh, seven years before I was born and so I never got a chance to work with him. But I'm very pleased to be part of a community that, that still remembers him. So uh, over the recent weeks I've been trying to gather some material and I managed to get in touch with three retired members of staff in my department who worked with Tom Flett and remember him and had nice things to say. Um, particularly you know, um, my former colleague Rodney Sharp who when I was a PhD student was very much working and you know, gave me advice at various points. He said very nice things about um, Flett's uh, work ethic, uh, you know, his willingness to take on jobs on behalf of the department. So he was an, an early editor of uh, the Journal of the London Mathematical Society, and he took that job on because he thought it would um, paint Sheffield in a good light, and it, it did, I think. Anyway, I don't really like giving talks about maths. I, I like giving talks that contain maths, and so what I thought I'd do would be to talk you through uh, a small piece of T.M. Flett's maths uh, and try to paint it in a good context. And he did me an incomparable favor here because um, he proved a theorem that can readily be explained to a bunch of people sitting in a cinema somewhere, which is not true of every mathematician nowadays. So anyway, here we go. Uh, I want to start with something that you're hopefully going to find pretty well obvious, which is that um, if you've got a big straight line forming a boundary between two regions, and if you go for a walk and your walk starts on one side of the boundary and it ends on the other side of the boundary, then at some point during that walk, there's a point when you're on the boundary. And of course, that, that is a, an obvious principle. And it, it sort of, you might wonder why one would care and why it's given a name. And I guess there's, there's two different directions you can come at why you'd want to know about things like this. Uh, so, from one point of view, it's, it's good that you can write it down and give it a name and talk about it, and it, it's called the Intermediate Value Theorem. Not because you're going to get impressed by it on its own, but because it's a useful tool for doing other things. 
And you know, it's it's nice to have building blocks because you know you want to you want to get to things that aren't quite obvious by stringing together a whole bunch of things that are obvious. And I'm going to show you something that maybe isn't quite obvious that you can do with the intermediate value theorem in, in just a moment. But uh, I mean, another reason why you care is that I can you know by way of warning, if you open a maths textbook and look up. Um, the intermediate value theorem, you will find something much technical, much more technical than I've just put on this slide. And there's kind of a good reason for that, that mathematics has to be written in a language where there's no cheating allowed. So, you know, for example, you know, I could imagine you sort of entertaining me with a huge number of objections. So what happens if we, if we jump over the boundary? Then there's no point where we're on it, actually. Or, or, or what if I, what if I were to to try to walk around it, or, or what if I invented a teleporter that would get me from, from one side to the other without ever being on it? And so the, the, lang the language that this mathematics is written in tends to be more technical because it's got to be written in a way that, that makes those loopholes just impossible. So if you, you open a maths book, you find a bunch of technical definitions, and the whole purpose of them is just to make this precise so that it's really true. Anyway. So I was going to give you a use of it, and I'm going to talk about chairs. So I'm pretty sure that everyone's had the experience of being sat on a chair, maybe outdoors or in some, some sort of uneven environment, and having to work a bit because the chair wobbles and it's very uncomfortable. And I can give a taxonomy of things that can go wrong here, but you know, one issue that could happen is that the two legs of, you know, two of the legs of the chair could be very long. Somehow the chair could be the problem. And I've, I've drawn a sort of extreme case where two legs of the chair are extremely long and two legs of the chair are extremely short. And in that case, you're just out of luck. I think, you know, if you've got that chair on, a, on an evenish ground or even a, only a slightly wonky bit of ground, you're just going to have those two short legs hanging in the air, and if you sort of put the chair over so that, so that one of them's on the ground, the, the other will be way up off the ground. So that's a situation which is just hopeless, and it's not the situation that I want to talk to you about today. The other situation is the one that does interest me. So it could be that the chair is of good quality, you know, the, the feet of the legs approximately form a square, but it's the ground that, that's at fault. This is the one that happens more commonly in my experience. And um, it's, it's a genuine problem, but I want to persuade you that no matter what the ground looks like, you can always get all four legs on the ground simultaneously just by rotating the chair in place. And I think that's something that's much less obvious than the intermediate value theorem. I, I, I think that that's genuinely an interesting fact. But the proof of it is, in fact, not much more than the intermediate value theorem. So let me try to explain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to name the legs. So I've labeled them on this diagram. I've labeled them A, B, C, D, and I've labeled them in, in some cyclic order around the, the foot. Now, as I've got it, um, D is hanging a little way above the ground. And I'm going, to I'm going to keep it this way. So what I'm going to do is, as I rotate it, I'm going to take care to have A, B, and C, those three legs, on the ground, which I can always do because, you know, if I put A down, then I can rotate the chair nicely to get B down, and then I can rotate it in the third direction to get C down, and I've lost control of D. D might be... D might be hovering in the air, or it could be that in the course of getting C on the ground, I've just sort of poked D into the ground. So I'm going to cope with the idea that D might be hanging in space. I'm also going to cope with the idea that D might be digging into the ground. I'm going I'm to live with that for now. This is just math, so I'm not actually going to drill any holes. Right. What happens when I rotate the chair, keeping my promise of keeping A, B, and C touching the ground at all points. Well, I claim after we've rotated this chair 90 degrees, leg D will be digging into the ground in this diagram. So, I mean, A will be where B is, and B will be where C is, and C will be where D is now, and then that means that D 
D will be sort of hidden somewhere under where A is currently. And in fact, something you might like to think about for a while is the following fact. So, so you know, it's a, it's a good exercise to think about maybe when you're sort of getting ready for bed or something, or maybe play with an actual chair and an actual wonky piece of ground. If you're in a situation where you've got chair legs A, B, C on the ground and D hovering above it, if you rotate it through 90 degrees, D will always be digging into the ground after that, and vice versa. If you're in a situation where A, B, and C are flat on the ground and D is digging in, then after a 90 degree rotation, D will also be always be hanging up in space. But once you've persuaded yourself of that, all I really need to do is to say the words intermediate value theorem. Because as I rotate the chair, I consider the position of D above the ground, and at some, you know, it, D goes for a walk where it starts above the ground and ends below the ground, and so at some point along its walk, D has touched the ground, and I just stop, stop my walk there, and all four legs of the chair are touching the ground simultaneously. So by, by rotating, rotating the chair between zero and 90 degrees, there'll be some point where it sits nicely on the ground. So that's a neat fact, and it's you know, occasionally of use. I've, I've occasionally tried to persuade people of this while I've been sort of sitting in a beer garden or something, and people have complained. And I said, why don't you rotate the chair? And they say, well, it won't work. And I said, well, try it, and it does. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a, a very sort of tame example of the kinds of things that people want to do with results such as this. So, um, next one I'll move on. I'm going to now talk about a result called the mean value theorem, which is um, of the same feel, but slightly more technical, and that's to do with sort of going for a walk. So, the idea is, suppose you go for a walk and you're kind of basically moving in one direction. You're always heading eastwards-ish. You can be heading, heading north-northeast or northeast or, or east or southeast or south-southeast or, or anything, but you, ne you never do any westing. You're always doing a bit of easting. So then the mean value theorem tells us that some way along your walk, there'll be a point where you're heading in exactly the same direction as the whole of the walk. So here, uh, I've got these two green lines that decorate my walk. So the, the big green line is like the, the total direction of the walk. It's the direction from the start point of the walk to the end point of the walk. And the mean value theorem says that there is some point on the walk where I'm heading in that direction. So this walk goes a bit, a bit north of the east, and there's gonna be some point along the way where I'm heading in that exact same direction, a bit north of the east. And in fact, I claim there are probably three such points along this particular walk. Uh, I, think, I think there's uh, another one at the very top of the walk, um, somewhere like there. And I claim there's probably a third one right at the beginning of the walk, somewhere like that, where I've just sort of got over the, the original heading southwards bit. But, the mean value theorem doesn't say there can't be lots, it says there's at least one. And that's kind of a use, useful fact quite a lot of the time. So there's, there's a point along your walk where you're kind of doing the thing that the whole walk does. And it's useful for, for purposes that are slightly more technical than the intermediate value theorem, but it's nevertheless a kind of good way of, of analyzing the behavior of real life systems and such like. Okay. And again, if you read an elementary book on, on mathematical analysis, a book that, that's sort of introducing you to the, to the mean value theorem, what you'll get will be a big bag of technicalities again. And um, mathematicians have to make no apology for that because the techni technicalities do matter. So I told you all about the have to head east thing. And that's really important. So here I've got a walk where you do some squiggling around and the total, the total direction of the walk, the, the direction from start to finish is kind of due north in this walk, but at no point 
in how I've set it up, are you actually heading due north? You kind of go off northwest and then you go south for a bit and then you come back northeast and you've never gone due north. So the, so the technicalities do matter. And then there are a few other technicalities that are kind of really horrible and you don't really want to think about. So things like, how about I head northeast for a while and then I sort of do that and you never saw me head, head due east and then I head southeast for a while and the total direction of my walk has, has been east but I kind of quickly flipped from going northeast to southeast and you never saw me go east. So there's something naughty about that point where you, you jump and a technical statement of the mean value theorem will rule that out. So it's a, you know, it says something about how your walk's got to be kind of gradual enough that you do have a little moment where you're pointing in the direction along there. So it can, it can be straight for a long while and then have a nice curved bit at the top and that's fine because at the top of that curved bit you'll be heading due east and that's fine. But yeah, there'll be a long chat beforehand about what it means to be a smooth enough walk that this, this principle applies. Okay, so Flett's mean value theorem is a, is a variant of that and it kind of very much sits into the same family of describing the properties of, of walks and it's subject to very similar technical conditions that differ only very slightly. And this time you have an extra condition. You're going for a walk, you're, you're generally heading eastwards, but you've got to have a walk that begins and ends facing in the si same direction. So here's, here's a walk. Um, I've chosen a walk that sort of begins and ends in the same direction. So, so when you start, you're heading basically east but a tiny bit south. When you finish, you're heading in the same basically east and a tiny bit south direction. So the claim is there is some point along the way of the walk where you're facing the end point, a point where you're, you're looking directly at where you're going to end up. And I've got a picture of such a point there. So there's a point sort of round this, this southern, southern loop of the southern arc of the walk where you're facing directly at where you end. And in fact, just like my last example, I think if you stare hard, you'll be able to find two more of those. So there's, there's another one, I think, just before the end where you, you squiggle around and there's, there's another one up at, the, up at the top. But the slope is there's at least one there. And that's a kind of useful thing, just like with the rotating chair. It's a useful principle for finding neat points where things are satisfied. So... That's just kind of one of the, the many things that, that Flett did, but I think it's the one that's by far the easiest to explain to a general audience. I do feel I should sort of explain a little more of the context in which, in which Flett was working and the, the, the reason that he proved his theorems. So, I mean, not all of Flett's work looked exactly, exactly like that, but most of it did have this general feel of sort of analyzing paths and trying to trying to say things that are that are qualitative about their behaviors and this subject is organized into a big body of theory mathematical analysis there's, there's loads of textbooks on it in, including one by flat uh, i think the the really obvious ways of using it are all in physics so so if you you know if you learned a bit of it and were asked to guess what it would be useful for i think your answer would almost certainly be it's for physics. And you'd not be wrong as far as it goes. So, you know, and the thing is, of course, you have all these physical processes, and much of the time they can be given by very simple laws, but if you work out the consequences of those simple laws, you can get some very complicated patterns of behavior. And those patterns of behavior can be so complicated that you have to give up any hope you have of writing down a nice formula that explains what's going on. What you have to do is sort of start scrambling to find little facts that you can that you can say about the behavior even though you don't understand all of it so things like there'll be a point where you're heading in roughly the same direction as your walk there'll be a point where you're facing the end there'll there'll be a point where you cross this boundary and i mean the state of the art is really embarrassing we we don't yet understand how water flows through pipes uh we don't even understand fully how water flows through pipes even when we're guaranteed that it won't be turbulent. Uh, turbulence is, is scary and nobody wants to understand it, but even non-turbulent flow is scary enough that we don't understand it fully. But it's very nice to have these principles and you want to say, well, I mean, if it flows, 
everything's going to come out of the pipe sooner or later. Principles like that are nice. You know, you won't, you, you won't get bits of water stopping, stopping forever in the pipe. Principles like that are really useful, and they depend on this kind, this kind of sort of all-step reasoning about how things behave. But that mostly isn't what Flett did. So um, Flett's use of analysis was, was a rather surprising one. So as, as was mentioned earlier, um, he studied under J. E. Littlewood in Cambridge. And the school of Littlewood was a, a, was a sort of a mini renaissance in British mathematics. So um, Newton, of course, was, was around in Cambridge hundreds of years ago and, and doing great pure mathematics. But then after Newton, there was really very little pure mathematics in England for centuries. There were, there were people doing little bits of physics. There, were, you know, there was Maxwell and, and you know, doing bits of physics in England for a while and then doing more of it in Scotland. But nobody doing pure maths. And um, so the, the British School of Pure Maths was really, really restarted by Littlewood and another mathematician, Hardy, uh, around the, the turn of the last century. And one of the big ideas they had was, was a range of ways in which they could apply mathematical analysis to, to number theory. So they started uh, making arguments about the dis distribution of things like the prime numbers. And their idea was, if you take the prime numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on, and you kind of try to work out exactly where they are, that's rather complicated. But if you replace it by approximations, if you say, I'll kind of try to keep track of how many primes there are roughly over a, over a spread of time. Maybe that's something that's amenable to mathematical analysis. Maybe, maybe, I can, maybe I can prove results that say, for example, there'll be some primes between a million and two million, but I don't want, don't want to tell you what they are. Yeah. And like the first, the first fact you, you can prove using analysis about the prime numbers is if you tell me a number, There'll always, be a, there'll always be a prime between that number and twice that number. So if you say 500, there'll always be a prime between 500 and 1,000. There'll always be a prime between 1,000 and 2,000, or 4,000 and 8,000. So, but you can, do, you can do much more precise results. That, that, that's just the first in the, in the story. And Hardy and Littlewood um, applied this for, for many years to great effect. And you know, when, when Flett studied under, under Littlewood, he was sort of inducted into that school and I think that was really what motivated him right I'm done um, enjoy your trip and look at where you're going at some point <laughs> okay thank you very much James so um on the 13th of September, 1955, our dad left his bicycle in Inverness. I've got to stand very close. Uh, he left his bicycle in Inverness, and he took the train, and then the bus to Strabster, and he got the boat, and he came to, came to Stromness. And he'd come to learn about traditional dancing in Orkney. But why? <laughs> so we'd like to tell you the story of our dad's second career as a dance collector. In 1930s London, he'd seen his, his parents' generation dancing in the style of Scottish dancing that they'd learned in Scotland before the First World War. And then in Cambridge, uh, the, the Cambridge Real and Space Society, the Cambridge Real Society, there were similarly, there were many mature students going back to study after the Second World War, and they'd also learned in various places. And he always said that the, um, the style was... Uh, still that of the Naffy Canteen, and essentially similar to how his parents were dancing in, in London before the war. And that's actually very fairly tame-looking dancing going on there, but that's our parents dancing in the middle, which is rather nice to see. So, but back in Scotland, dancing of the old reels and country dances had declined in the 1900s, and it was only when girl guides started learning English dances that they realised they should start reviving Scottish, Scotland's own dances. And so this was how the Scottish Country Dance Society was formed. And they devised a standard style, which they chose to base more or less on the sort of 19th century ballroom version of, of Scottish country dancing. And as this movement came further south, our dad began to ask, 
Was this really how ordinary people used to dance? And what about regional variations? And then it was another mathematician, there's lots of mathematicians in this story, um, who was also at Cambridge. He'd been at Bletchley Park, but anyway, that's another story. And he really started his quest. The Scottish Country Dance Society had resurrected a number of older dances from publications. And Hugh Thurston went and looked back at those sources, and he said, well, actually, many of these are English. So again, we are questioning, what were the traditional dances of Scotland, and what do they look like? So together, our parents started their own research. They absorbed anything they could find about written about dancing in Scotland, absolutely anything written in hundreds of years they found and, and read and absorbed it. And they were intrigued by the mention of a number of older Gaelic dances. And they wondered if they might still be being danced or known about somewhere, anywhere. And in 1953, they decided to try a trip to the Hebrides and see what they could find. And so the, the, this is the only science bit here. I mean, the geography is, is important because the, the hope is that the tradition might, might last longer in your remote, your remote areas, and that's sort of geography as well as, um, you know, as well as communications. So in Barra, their one named contact, they only had this one pain, sadly had got on the boat that they'd just got off. So that wasn't, that was not such lucky. But they persevered and they were eventually directed up the hill um, to Neil McNeil. He was 89 and he was a tall sort of Viking character and luckily had his son there so he could translate for them. And he was able to give them the full details of two of those older dances and the music, and though he hadn't done those dances for more than 67 years. They fairly danced down the hill. So that was how it started. This is how all of it started. And his math speak, he, he wrote down, it said, it proved the existence theorem. And it gave them confidence. They were amazed, though, they, to find how little dance collecting there had been. Loads and loads of song collecting all over Scotland, but um, very little dance collecting, even in 1950s. And they went on to make a series of journeys covering most of, and I do have a map, Yes, we have a um, series of journeys covering most of mainland Scotland, as well as the Hebrides, Orkney and Shetland. I'm sorry, Orkney's chopped off the top. Uh, there isn't, we're, we're coming back to Orkney later. So, um, but that's, that shows you the sort of main areas he, he went round the villages. He chose each sort of each, you can sort of see the sort of areas he started, and he went round each of the villages. And he travelled mainly by uh, bicycle and train, so this is a different era to what we think of today. Um, and he was funded only by marking an exam papers, no, no public funding, nothing at all. Literally, they used all their spare money. And he had to make do with a tin of fruit. This always amuses Howie. He made do with a tin of fruit for his lunch. And he averaged about 20 days away a year, um, right up to 1960. Our mum went along the odd, with holidays, and Lindsay came along, and, and Lindsay was there occasionally. But for his Orkney trip, he was away for 22 days on his own. So it was sort of probably quite a lonely, lonely thing, my mother used to say. He did used to get lonely. So the quality of their field work is, is still referenced today, especially for the way our dad recorded and extracted information. And I say recorded because it was written longhand in his tiny pencil handwriting that he used for his mathematics. So on top of record, uh, dance, collecting dances, they recorded the style, and they asked people where they danced, how they learned, what steps they used, and the occasions and the customs where there was dancing. And their information pieced together on dancing teachers alone is, is fantastic. And I'll just tell you a little bit about these. So this is Dancy James Neal. Um, Dancy is what they were the known dancing masters were always often called. And um, he taught in the area around Forfar and Glans. And then, yes, that is the Queen Mother um, having her dancing lesson. But in Orkney, uh, we know that um, Mr. Mackenzie was teaching in North Ronaldsea, and he was, he was teaching dances from the south in North Ronaldsea in 1882. Mr. William Smith came from Inverness to teach in Flotter, from Inverness note. And Mr. Clayton came from Elgin. And he taught also in Flotter about 1905. And then he went off to Barra in 1910. And so you begin to see how the dances spread. 
I'm going to take you back to Lindsay. <laughs> yeah. So what did they find? Putting together the literature research they'd done and the field work, but remembering that their emphasis was on what was remembered, what was there in living memory. So they weren't, they didn't, they didn't concentrate on the, the, his, the historical stuff. They were looking for living memory. They published Traditional Dancing in Scotland in 1964, and it is known as a landmark in Scottish dance history and social history. It became tr clear that the true, the, in, the true indigenous dances of Scotland were reels, alternating setting steps with a moving figure, either a circle or a, like a re reel of three. Within, within early living memory, the only dances on flutter were reels. All other dances were superimposed on this background of the reels, often displacing them. None of these were national folk dances. These were just the social dances of the day. Lightweight country dances were arrived from England in about 1700, only reaching Orkney in the 1880s and not reaching Shetland at all. The quadrilles arrived in Edinburgh in 1816, and they survived today as the Lancers and the Eights and Reel. They were taught in Bursey in about 1885, but the older folk didn't like them at all. Lastly, the waltz came to Britain in 1812. And in Orkney, it took many years to arrive. But we do know that Sir John Franklin was seen dancing the waltz in Stromness in 1845. Dances like the Eva three-step were brought to flutter by the troops in First World War. People danced in their ordinary shoes, or maybe their best shoes, in a natural style. Strathspeys were faster. The travelling step was, sorry, Strathspeys were faster and there was no time for today's stately glide. Adding extra percussive beats in the travelling steps was widespread in lowland Scotland, like you see in Cape Breton today. In our lifetime, where has all the noise gone? The hyucks and the clicking of the fingers and the arm movements. Where's it gone? There were many regional variations in, in steps. For example, they found 19 real steps. Over 60 steps for the Highland Fling instead of the Competition 8. They found almost all of the lost Gaelic dances they went looking for. The last one turned up in Cape Breton. Then there were the many Highland step dances, the clog dances, and the old reels from the Hebrides, Orkney, and Shetland. Over the years, probably thousands of people have danced dances that our parents collected without knowing who rescued them. Our parents published widely in journals and letters, and there were two more books on step dancing. Our mum was still giving talks on dancing well into her late 80s, and we have a handout of the books and the flat archives available online. Oops, wrong way. Here are their team, the Marlowe Scottish Dancers in Holland. After the devastating floods in 1953, the Dutch government started holidays at home and the team were invited in 1957. Their programme included Orkney and Shetland reels, and they were watched by a total of 30,000 people over the time they were there, and a television audience of half a million. This quote from the English collector, Cecil Sharp, sums up the dance collecting. I have made many friends whom I value, and have had more than a few adventures. Jane is going to tell you about our dad's Orkney adventure in 1955. 
and back back to 1955. And um, um, our dad had a, a huge collection, a huge network, I say, of um, musicians and other collectors. He he wrote wrote to all sorts of people, and one of these was um, Peter Kennedy. Peter worked for the uh, BBC, and he travelled widely recording music and songs, and that's actually Peter in 1955, but not, not here in Orkney. Um, so in a, in a letter that we have, uh, Peter says, I've just been to Orkney, and um, Tom might like to know what dances they have. And so our dad immediately arranges to meet him in London, and obviously heard enough to think that a trip might be worthwhile. So this is what we always called as, this is the flat look. So the Kennedy Archive for the 8th of July. The first person I met in the street in Duby was Jack Tate Taylor, the best guide and informant I could have had. So the Flett Archive, 13th of September. Tom Flett, that's not himself, that's another Tom Flett, gave me a lift to Doomby and I stayed there till Friday. His notes say, we arranged a dance in the community centre for, for some of the older folk of Doomby. Mr. John Tate, the same Mr. Tate, of Doomby made the arrangements for me and the music was supplied by Mr. James Garson. And that was quite a rare event because mostly he was talking to older people and they were just on their own or just one or two of them in their home and talking and they would just be dancing around or he'd dance and show them. And so that was quite a rare event. In Orkney, so the six and reel was, was the main, remembered as the main dance done until well into the late 1800s. And this is a reeling figure. There's um, three couples who will set or step, do some stepping to each other. And then as a unit, each of the couples will do a figure of eight reeling figure. And in a few places, it was used at the bride's reel. So that again, he'd, he'd find out about the customs. But it wasn't done very much after 1905. So, I mean, we were so lucky that he was there in 1950. Because if you tried now, all these things would have got lost. In Doomby, only half of the group knew the Six and Reel, but they managed to dance it to their satisfaction, as he said. Along with a number of circle dances, that's your, um, like, couple dances, we might say now, um, and country dances. And one that they found, he only ever found in Doomby, which is called Hands Across. And on Flutter, Mrs. David Flett of the Dam was, was very positive of how the Six and Reel was danced. She demonstrated on the table using teaspoons without any, taste, any hesitation, using teaspoons for the ladies and knives for the men. So, and we have this fabulous cartoon. And see, since Howie's here, I can get, can Howie read that out for me? <laughs> We've got the bit on the right, Howie. Can you read that for me? <laughs> <laughs> She's got a mic for him. Yes, sir. It's from the, the Spike cartoons. Uh, uh, Bob Johnston, who actually wasn't Arcadian, he came from Bucky, and he had a wonderful ear for Orkney voices. A collector of folk dances has just been visiting Orkney, and this is what she said. But the ends know a folk dance, Professor. Tam just, um, Tam just, what's that word? <laughs> oh, Bang. Tam just banged his thumb with a hammer. <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you, Howie. Sorry, I should have warned you about that. <laughs> um, and it was, it was really nice because he got presented with that, the original of the cartoon afterwards. And, but the nice thing about that is that the, the, the collector is dressed as a, um, a traditional dancing master might have been dressed. So that's, that's all we, we always love that one. And we'll, we're nearly finishing. We're nearly finishing. We're nearly there. So, so by chance one day... Our dad was having uh, lunch, possibly here in the Kirk bar of the Kirkwell Hotel, and he got chatting to someone who said, oh, I know a dance from my home, home island of North Ronaldsea. And this was Roy Scott and his wife, Ivy. And Ivy told, and they told our dad all about the Axum Reel. And when we were last here in 2013, this was lovely, and we mentioned the Scots, and a lady popped up and said, they were my parents. And this was their daughter Ella, who's we're so pleased is here again on the ground on the on the well, so that that last time was fifty eight years ago, so sixty eight years ago our dad was talking to Ella's parents. So we have Ella here in the middle next to Lindsay, and the other lady is Elsie Johnson, and our dad spoke to Elsie's parents, 
and they were Jock and Ethel Finlater, who many people might know of as of, of people from, from, who were singers. So Peter Kenny recorded the Finlaters in 1955, and our dad met Ella and, and, and the Finlaters, and they were, dance, they were at that dance in, in, in Doomby. And Elsie's parents had kept in touch with Peter Kennedy, and Ella's parents had kept in touch with our parents. So these were how the, some of the friends they met on their journeys, and it's just, it's just fabulous. So, so I'll tell you a little bit more about the Axum Reel. And, um, so the Axum Reel is quite, it's, it's an interesting one, because this is really the most complex reeling figure that there is in a dance. And um, if anybody's dance, any dancers are here, there's Shihalian reels, there's a dance called the Shihalian, Shihalian reel, and the real figure is based on the Axum reel figure, if that rings any bells. Um, but there's also an interesting story about its publication. So, um, if you remember the Scottish Country Dance Society, our dad was fairly, probably fairly robust in his views of their, the style that they, 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 would, they were dancing. Um, but he also had misgivings about the way they, shall we say, edited the dances for publication. And North Ronald C. Axon Reel is a, is a case in point. The Scots son, uh, Ella's brother Ronald, had sent the Axon Reel notation to the Society in 1950. But nothing had happened by 1955. They did say they would publish it, but nothing had happened. So our dad asked for the Scots, Scots permission to publish it himself. But also immediately it suddenly appeared in the society's book and our dad was not impressed um, anyway and so he sent the copy to the Scots Roy and Ivy Scott for their view and we have we have their reply we have Ivy's reply so here's Dr. Near Dr. Flett and it carries on and it says you who have visited the Isles know how remote they are from each other North Ronaldson, remotest of all, and how jealously they treasure their individuality. The society have simply copied out Ronald's choreography of dance and left out the most important feature, its history and tradition. And I'm sorry, I've written as a bridal dancer at the end of that, sorry. But the Axum Roll Reel played a role in weddings in North Ronaldson. It was done as the last dance in the evening. And you'd have the bridal couple, and they would link arms back to back in the middle, and the, the, the dancers would weave around them. And at the call of runny toot, the fiddler would slowly speed up from this raspe tempo, and he'd speed up and speed up until he was going a fair lick, until the dancers were really tightly weaving around that couple. And but when the music stopped, the couple had to let go arms, turn around and kiss each other before any of the other people dancing could get to them and kiss them themselves. So this is part of the, the, the sort of the social history our dad collected. So with, with the, the Scott family blessing, our dad had his own notes of the Axum Reel published in 1956, and the editor of the Orkney Herald was very happy to oblige, and he put that cartoon on the top of the articles as well, which was lovely to see it again. And um, the Scots, in fact, invited Ella and her sister to come and watch, but they decided that their parents would come and he invited them to come down and watch when the Marlowe Scottish Dance, his, his, his demonstration team, went and performed the Axum Reel at the Ice Steadford in, uh, in North Wales. And Roy and Ivy, they drove all the way down, and they stayed with us in our family home. And Roy was remembered for saying that there were more people in the Ice Steadford field than in the whole of Orkney. So we've got a picture. This is a brilliant picture. So here's a, there's the Marlowe Scottish dancers actually at the, the Ice Turf, and the, the ladies' dresses are gorgeous, beautiful coloured coloured dresses, and they were based on sort of an historical costume. And for the action reel, the men didn't wear a kilt, though they wore just the ordinary trousers, because obviously the kilt wasn't being worn, hadn't been worn here. And that day was remembered um, over 60 years later by a friend of ours who was one of the dancers, and the team. They first demonstrated the Axum Reel, the, the, the version that the Society had published, and they've demonstrated as, as they'd written it and published in Book 18. And they did that version to the Scots, and there were some horrified faces. What has happened? And then they were incredibly relieved when our parents danced, the family team, the, the team danced it again, exactly as our dad had notated it from Roy and Ivy Scott. 
incredibly relieved. Anyway, so the team went on to dance it in the competition. And they came quite a, a respectable fifth, given it was an international competition. And so they all left the field with the Scots in their coach. And the windows were wide open in the co coach. And the two pipers were playing at full belt as they, they went off in triumph. So well, thank you very much. That's, that's how we're going to finish for a moment. We do also have a little clip later, but we'll have some questions first. So thank you very much again to James. And thank you again for Howie for the invitation. Um, thank you. Absolutely fascinating. It was great to see my uh, birth and hometown of Brechin on the uh, collection map, so I was, I was really chuffed at that. Now, we've got time for a few questions. There's a lot coming through uh, through Slido. If anybody in the audience is wanting to ask a, a question, please put your hand up. But to um, kick things off, I shall uh, ask a few. The, the, very, the very start, there's a comment coming. Your mother, Joan, must have been quite a mathematician herself, being able to proofread her husband's work. Did, did she ever do any research maths either? No, no. I think it was just that she, she learnt to read it. She learnt to read it, and she, and she just eventually got so used to it, she did it that much. She didn't understand a word of what she was reading. She just read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another comment come in regarding the, uh, the mathematics, his, his theorem. And it was, uh, have Flett's theories ever been used in the design of stealth aircraft or uh, ships or weapons in, in, in a way that they give false readings to misdirect the enemy, for example? I, obviously, I'm uh, not at liberty to disclose, which is a, <laughs> a, 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 a cool-sounding way of saying I don't know. But... Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. There's, um, yeah, th there's a long tradition in, in aeronautics of sort of, you know, knowing that you want some sweet point and then using results like this to pr prove theoretically that such a sweet point exists and then sending it off to people in laboratories to find out where it is through experimental methods. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lovely comment coming here and I echo this one as well. It's got, I love that at dances and weddings, all ages get up to do the traditional dances, uh, from the wee bairns, even teenagers, through to those in their 80s, and that, that is a thing, and especially in Scotland, and it's a great tradition to, to keep up. And we don't worry that we know the steps exactly either, it's just for fun and enjoyment at the end of the day. So, but there is one specific question that's come in, someone who obviously knows about local dancing, is the, is the Westerly One Step a unique dance? Or is it based on another Scottish dance? <laughs> well, my, Matt's might know. I'm afraid I don't. I do have done the Westry One Step, but I don't actually know his history. But I don't know whether Matt's, we have Matt's here might be able to answer that oh. one. So you know, he's also got probably got a question. So. <laughs> okay. Hello there, um, Matt Smilling here. Thank you very much for a lovely talk. Um, Westry one step, there are a number of one steps out there from different dancing masters, and I would say that the Westry is just a local variant of one of those, but it has a very distinct way of being performed, so you can certainly tell it has a kind of local connotation to the island of Westry. You know, it doesn't look like any other one step as such, so they have put their the local taste the stamp on it, so yes. As I got this, I'd just like to give you one comment, and you might enjoy this. At my own wedding in 1994 in uh, Sweden, I married an Arcadian uh, lady, Emma, and we did both the Axum Reel. We were back to back, turning around before anyone could come to us. We had practice beforehand <laughs> just to disentangle ourselves, and we did another Sixum Reel where uh, the men were swapping places until. Emma and I joined hands and danced as well. So there are a few of those wedding reels, but we decided to do two of them at our wedding because we could and because we enjoyed it. So there you go. Thank you again. Okay. And here's uh, another question come in for your, yourselves. It's, uh, are you ladies still involved in Scottish traditional dancing? Um, absolutely. <laughs> um, we both dance. 
um, locally every week, <laughs> more or less. So, um, but I, I, we also, we, what we haven't covered at all is that our dad actually did, carried on into England. After he sort of finished in Scotland, he didn't, he went on to do collecting in England. So we, we learned um, clog dancing from the northwest of England, and we both taught clog dancing from England, step dances from Scotland, and I helped run a Cayley club, and so I actually teach teach dances these days as well as doing Scottish country dancing. So yes, we've, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I remember when I was a young lad that I used to get, uh, well, kind of felt I got forced into learning Scottish country dancing, but in actual fact, it was really enjoyable once you got into it. Um, and someone's asked, is it important to maintain Scottish country dancing in schools? What benefits, what physical and intellectual benefits do people get from, from doing it? Uh, I think I mean it, it, I think once they start start learning, it is enjoyable, isn't it? I think I think our dad's sort of concern was how you, you don't want to formalise it too much. Um, you want to make it something people join in without too much tuition. I think I was always quite keen to say you don't you shouldn't have to go and learn these dances. And originally, people didn't dance very often, um, so they had a, quite a small repertoire of dances. And I, I think, yes, physically, it's fascinating. I've taught um, a bit of Scottish and, uh, Scot and English dancing in schools. And it's just to, to learn a little bit about their local culture, but they also learn, um, you know, about, about a cultural event and something they can use later in life. And, and then physically, it's quite good fun. And, and they're learning to interact with each other. And, you know, there's, there's, there's very, lots of benefits. Well, thank you. I've got a whole host of stuff here, but we're running out of time, so unfortunately I'm going to have to start to bring it to a close. Now, for, we are about to watch a, a YouTube video clip. So for those of you online, there is a link in the... There is a, hello? There is a link in the, uh, in the chat to, to click onto the YouTube but you'll have, to, you'll have to leave this particular uh, presentation. But for you guys live in the audience, we are just about to click onto the YouTube link and we can watch it live. So thank you to the online audience. We shall see you again on another event at the Orkney International Science Festival. Are we okay? Yes, thank you. Sorry. It's not um, an Orkney dance, and I'll get told off later. But this is a 